Wolves of Croton. The Untold Story of Milo. John Abdo. Chapter 2. Competition Mode. November, 541 BC. Milo. Age 19. I so much as continues. Strong Ionian gusts pushed the alien sea craft into the Crotonian harbor ahead of schedule. Decorated with a conglomerate of flags representing city-states from all around the world, the craft has traveled to Croton from Elias, the Greek-owned polis which has authority over the games contested in Olympia. Standing on the vessel's figurehead draped in a purple cloak, holding an engraved wooden staff, his head crowned with a sacred laurel wreath, an alien trumpeter sounds his horn then announces the date for the grand event. Ten months from this day, the Herald proclaims, the greatest of all the world's youth athletes are invited to compete in the World Youth Games. For five days during the month of August, the glorious event is staged at Olympia, the earthly sanctuary for the Pantheon King, Zeus. Athletes must vow to uphold the Olympian oaths and demonstrate their commitment to egg by conditioning their bodies for ten consecutive months progressing up to the Games. Per the authority granted to him as a Crotonian diplomat, but Acids is handed a parchment that outlines the events and rules. Although it is known as a peaceful state, Croton must pledge the armistice, a sacred truce serving to suspend all military actions for the three months leading up to and preceding the Games, allowing safe travel for all who plan to attend the grand event. As the people rejoice in the announcement, an extemporaneous psychic transformation takes possession of Croton, with athletes, performers, coaches, and citizens alike springing into competition mode, mentally and physically, the competitors pursue an upward aim from base to peak conditioning. The people begin preparing for, and prognosticating about, the results of the contests, fabricating conclusions as to how Crotonian athletes will match up against the greatest youth challengers from around the world. All youth competitors, a category which terminates before contestants 20th annum, are granted the opportunity to qualify. The males can select to compete in the running events, stayed, Dai Aulos and Dalajas, Javelin and Discus Throwing, Long Jump, Boxing, Pancration, or Stand Up Wrestling. The tryouts drew greater crowds than any other World Youth Games qualifiers. Hundreds of aspiring Crotonian athletes and performers crowded the Palustra and theaters, all not only eager to compete, but equally motivated by rumors that Milo could decide to represent Croton in these games. Since he was 19, this would be the final year the team who carries the bull would qualify as a youth. As for myself, approaching age 9 at the time and thus slightly outmatched by my teenage teammates, I had no plans to try out for any of the athletic events. Instead, my focus was on qualifying as a trumpeter and herald. Seated at the top of the athletic delegation is one of Croton's chief statesmen, but acids. The elder sits alongside Croton's head athletic trainer, Philostratus, as well as Caliphon and his team of anatomists and physiologists. And coordinating the examinations are former Olympiad victors. The first of the qualifying rounds is physical appearance. Each athlete is required to stand naked in front of the committee as his body is thoroughly examined. The three basic categories include muscular symmetry, poise, and statuesque composure. The initial pose is to stand upright, chin raised to elongate the neck, shoulders pulled back to uplift the chest and flatten the abdomen, legs straight, and feet parallel to one another and placed at a shoulder's width stance. Arms are to hang evenly to one side with palms facing forward. After upright posture has been examined, each athlete is asked to engage in dynamic motion, beginning by slowly rotating their heads to the right, then reversing past center across to the left, followed by the same patterns for torso pivots. The object is for the committee to observe physical gracefulness and elegant transitions. After striking all body positions, the athletes will rotate their entire bodies. The pattern requires quarter turns to their right, followed by two second pauses, then repeating the semicircular order until all quadrants have been scrutinized. Mindful attention is directed toward the eloquence of each torso pivot and foot rotation, and the coordination of the pause and proceed sequence. To complete dynamic motioning, 
Athletes are directed to walk around the perimeter of the palustra set to a march-like cadence, supported by percussions. This lesson serves the utmost importance as all performers, solo and in groups, are to engage in public appearances, processions, parades, and arena entries and exits, so it much pays to prepare Crotonian athletic delegates to appear nimble and emboldened before all spectators and dignitaries from around the world. After physical examinations, and for their final round of qualification, each athlete is asked to demonstrate his specific skills. Runners race. Throwers and jumpers try to outdistance one another. Wrestlers wrestle. And performers, females now included, recite their poetry and sing, dance and tumble, gallop and pirouette their equines, and play their instruments. As the qualifiers unfold, Everybody is curious as to what sport Milo plans to compete in. But until the team can actually be located, there is no way of knowing. As is typical for him, Milo has been living in the wilds, so the team, of which I am part, is ordered by Podacids to go out and locate Croton's strongest team. Why? A party of trappers had spotted several ungulate kills in the region northwest of Botsdolnato and southeast of the Kravis River. Believing the wolves were roaming that region, the team sprinted across the hinterlands in pursuit of Milo to deliver the formal invitation. After 17 winding miles, we reached the southwestern ridge of the Kravis Valley, off the Sela Plateau. As we stood atop the elevated vantage point, I began sounding my horn. The resounding echoes could be heard for miles. Certain Milo was receiving our calls, we eagerly awaited a response, but it was unusually quiet, so we continued to make our presence known. But still, nothing. Startled, we began to think we had not run far enough. Point your trumpet upward, Eratos then suggested. Perhaps the wind will carry your sounds further. So I tilted my head rearward, holding my trumpet perpendicular to the ground, and sounded my horn louder than before. The sounds carried to greater distances, and the echoes endured longer. But again, no response of any kind. As darkness was fast approaching, we had no other choice but to descend into the valley, navigate the unwelcoming topography, and scale the opposite side, which was unfortunately another 18 miles in the distance. Then, about 50 yards after we started our descent, we were stopped dead in our tracks, quickly realizing we were surrounded by wolves. Intentionally avoiding eye contact, a sure way to instigate fierce aggression, we began to notice the wolves were posturing themselves into subordinate positions, heads dipped, tails wagging ever so slightly, and hackles relaxed. In a whisper, Lysino said, Milo must be close. Glycon, not so confident, gestured to me, sound your trumpet. Again, I pointed my horn to the sky, and just as I was ready to empty my lungs, we heard a rallying howl coming from the ridge we had just crossed. Immediately, we spun around, and after several excruciatingly long seconds, we noticed something sneaking up from behind the bushes. We all wondered if the wolves were preparing to attack, but our concern quickly vanished as Milo crawled toward us, walking on all fours. Gradually erecting himself to a bipedal stance, Milo made for an amazing sight. He was naked, his long hair disheveled, and his body scarred, bruised, and bloodied. Relax, Milo commanded. You need not shout or blow your horn. Referring to the wolves and himself, Milo continued, We have been watching you from the moment you left the palustra. But why have you allowed us to run so far to find you? Hippostratus asked with a breathy voice. Do not runners benefit from running? Milo replied, waging a question of his own. After a long, dumbfounded hesitation, simultaneously, all of us broke into hysterical laughter. We were so happy to have finally found Milo. We rushed over to hug him and to feel his large muscles. But as we approached, the wolves snapped into protective postures. Hackles now raised, releasing growls with their lips shrugged, exposing long, pointy canines. As we all froze, Milo released a grunt, and the entire pack returned to subservient postures. We could not keep our hands off him. As we were feeling his muscles, we asked many questions, while sharing with him stories of our lives in Croton. We missed you, Milo. Your muscles are so much bigger. 
Looks like this place is feeding you well. You live with the wolves, but you are built like a bull. We want big muscles, too. Save some meat for us. We wanted to spend the night in the wilds with him, but our assignment was to announce the news, then return to Croton with Milo. Switching to a serious note, Hippostratus finally delivered the message, Croton has been invited to participate in the World Youth Games that will be contested in Olympia. We come to recruit you for the Grand Athletic Competition. Milo scratched the back of his neck, then responded, Why? Stupefied by the question, Hippostratus awkwardly navigated a reply, These are festivals that test one country's strength against others in fair competition without the use of military weapons. The Greeks believe athletic contests reduce tensions between states and stave off warfare, sparing the strains of funding the military. Compete for Croton, Milo, and you will be protecting your people from potential turmoil and bloodshed. Switching to his other hand to scratch the back of his neck, Milo just looked at us and asked, Fair competition? Judges and officials oversee the events, Hippostratus replied. Athletes compete in arenas under preordained rules held in honor of Zeus. We stood gazing into Milo's eyes, trying to sense why he was not as thrilled as we were about him competing in the games. As he remained unresponsive, we simultaneously shrugged our shoulders, then like and jumped in. Olympia is 200 miles from Mount Olympus. Its peak rises 10,000 feet above sea level. Fiery stellar munitions, hurled down from the heavens, explode into collages of brilliant colors that streak across the skies. Lightning blares down its slopes to discourage intruders from reaching Zeus' dominion. Massive mountain lions are guardians to the base. Elusive snow leopards surveil the peak. Hunting Ibex and Shammy is the pride of the raptors. Just the right accommodations for the son of Zeus. Milo took a couple steps back, then sat himself down, remaining unresponsive. You live in the mountains and timberlands and nobody sees you, Eratos then bids to Milo. Many rumors discredit your existence, framing Milo of Croton as political propaganda. Only you can reveal the true son of Zeus to the world. The ignoramuses recite disparaging satire about you, says Glycon. Their portrayals are created from their naive imaginations. Others are compensated to conjure up deceit and mockery. Each story we hear about you is more distorted than the last. Allow all people the opportunity to lay their own eyes on you. Let us be the authors of your story. Let us be the artists and sculptors. Allow us to reveal the real Milo of Croton to the world. Building up the courage to speak, as I was the youngest of all the team, I said, Milo, if you avoid the games, the artist will paint pictures of Kairagio that make him look skinny. As my teammates struggled to contain their laughter, Milo looked each one of us in the eyes. After a long pause, he asked, are there competitions at these games for trumpet players? I was so inspired by his question, instead of answering Milo outright, I immediately raised my horn and sounded it with a force that exceeded that of all prior blows. Never before had I felt this kind of power expelling from my body. My ribcage inflated beyond its previous expansions as my lungs became exceedingly more voluminous. To be sure, my breath's expulsion had been stronger than that of any adult trumpeter I had ever heard. Trusting the vibrations from my horn had met the ears of the athletic delegation awaiting us back in Croton. I felt fully qualified to perform at these games. As the echoes from my horn began to fade, I shouted with great enthusiasm, People of the world, turn your attention to the Archstone Corridor, and welcome Milo of Croton into the arena. Readjusting my posture, I finally replied to Milo's question, Yes, I am training to become Croton's trumpeter and herald, storyteller, too. I have been preparing myself to announce your name at the games. In that case, Milo replied with a smile, let us begin our training. Thrilled with Milo's decision, I again sounded my trumpet, and in the company of the wolves, Milo and the team sprinted back to Croton.